The video today is a bit shorter than usual because I'm graduating and moving this week, so between packing, festivities, finals, and preparing for the new place, I haven't had much time to put anything really together at all in the past month, which has probably been obvious. Uh, despite this, there are still notes for this video, so I was at least able to do that. They are kind of brief, though. If everything goes well this week, then I'll have something really cool to show you soon. So I'm super excited about it, but anyhow, let's talk about curvature. Curves are great. For one, they let us visualize trends, but what if we were interested in just the curves themselves? How would we quantify how curvy a given curve is? It seems like a harmless question, but in general, curvature can be a computational mess to compute in many cases, and knowing about curvature and its generalizations in higher dimensions can help inform your intuition about the solution to one of the most famous solved problems in mathematics, the Poincaré conjecture. So what is curvature? For those that are a bit more jargon-oriented, the curvature is given by the norm of the derivative of the tangent vector at a point with respect to arc length. That's a bit of a mess to say, but symbolically, it just means this. Now, for a curve in three dimensions, and some regular parameterization, gamma, which is equal to uh, the ordered triple x of a, y of a, z of a, we can derive that the curvature is just the norm of the cross product of the first and second derivatives of gamma all over the norm of the first derivative of gamma cubed. The derivation of this formula for the curvature is incredibly helpful, and I went ahead and derove it in the notes. What's really nice about it is that it can be used to derive other formulas for curvature when a given curve is particularly special, like for a function, for instance, where the curvature is given by this formula. Okay, so we have some formulas, let's go through a few examples. A circle of radius r in a plane in 3 space can be parameterized by r cosine 2 pi t, r sine 2 pi t, and 0 for t in the interval from 0 to 1. Using the cross product formula for the curvature and the definition of cross product, we end up getting this massive daunting expression that ends up being quite tame. You can keep reducing it and it reduces down eventually to 1 over the radius of your circle. Alternatively, if we wanted to get the curvature of the graph of the function f of x equals x squared, we could just use the cross product formula as well by using the spatial parameterization t, t squared, and 0, which just takes the plane that the graph in, is in and shoves it into 3D space so that you can use the cross product formula. Or we can just use the function formula, which gives this expression. It's not clear, but it is a good exercise to check that these two methods are equivalent for computing the curvature. Probably the more helpful way to interpret curvature is geometrically. Given some curve that is at least twice continuously differentiable, the curvature at some point on the curve is the reciprocal of the radius of the largest circle that is tangent to the curve and is still bounded by the curve. Now this isn't a definition, but it's the geometric intuition behind what curvature is. This makes the circle example from earlier make a little bit more sense as the largest circle that is tangent to a circle and bounded by it is just itself. For our parabola example, if we look at the point on the graph at 0, 0 and use our curvature formula, we get a curvature of 2, which means the largest circle that is tangent to our graph at 0, 0 and is still bounded by it is the one with radius 1 half and centered at 0, 1 half, which kind of looks like this. These circles have a special name, and they're called osculating circles. Intuitively, the smaller the osculating circle at a point, the tighter the curve is at that point, and thus there is more curvature that is present at that point. And alternatively, the larger the osculating circle, the more strung out the curve is, and thus the less curvature at that point. In higher dimensions, curvature is a bit harder to define. And in fact, one could spend a lot of time figuring out just what kind of curvature they are concerned with. The ideas that are desirable in these generalizations are taken from properties of curvature of curves in two space and three space. One such curvature is the Ricci curvature, or Ricci curvature. I think it's Italian, so Ricci sounds sort of better. I'm not sure. Anyway, the Ricci curvature is used to define Ricci flow, which was used to produce the tools necessary to prove the Poincaré conjecture. 
Other types of curvature that are used in higher dimensions include the Gaussian or mean curvature, to name a couple. And they can also be used to define flows of curves and hypersurfaces as well. Anyhow, I have to cut myself off right now. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more mathematics videos. As always, I am Nathan, this is Chalk, and I will see you next time. Thank you.